Hello, everyone. It's time to take a look at issue number two of the Killer7 comic book, because issue number one and the promo comic were both so great. Great! And we have to keep going. We have to keep exploring the story of Killer7 in comic book form. And this time we're seeing... Well, we know where this scene takes place. This takes place in the restaurant Fukushima as Mask is piled on by Heaven Smiles, who for some reason are not exploding. I couldn't tell you why. I just might assume that the artist was taking liberties uh, and just had, you know, this luchador fighting a bunch of monsters. They should be exploding. They are not. I can't tell you why. What I can tell you is that we are... We're going uh, into page one, and it's like, well, okay, that's not really page one, that's the credits. Here, okay, here we go. Here we go. It starts off, you might remember how it ended last time, Mask blew up the entrance to the restaurant, blew up the, uh, the staff that turned into Heaven Smiles. They're laughing, and then they're not laughing anymore because Mask is standing over them. I just want to point out the title of this chapter, Sunset Part 2. To mock a killing bird. Yeah, just look at it. Just take it in. Stare at that name. That's the name of the issue we're reading today. Alright, that's enough of that. What it is time for is Mask, who is... Uh, he's just kind of pointing his guns up in the air. I don't know if that's supposed to be the reloading animation or if he's just enjoying all the fire. Not really sure what's happening there. But then he says Mierda as he looks through a door. It's like, guess what's happening there? Composition is kind of odd. There's like a brown thing. He's looking around it. He's shocked at what he sees. Ha ha ha. Oh no. Heaven smiles. Coming from somewhere. This... It's kind of hard to tell what's going on and where. I mean, what's going on is simple. Mask is in the restaurant. Heaven Smiles are in the restaurant. You don't really get much of a sense of place, though. A sense of space in this comic. Heaven Smiles are coming from somewhere. They're laughing. Mask is surprised. And then surprised again? Double surprised! Surprised twice in a row! Yes, these panels come right one right after the other. He is so surprised we had to see it twice because... Haha, ha, there's a smile crawling on the ceiling. You might remember this from the game. This is another smile. The smiles that climb on the ceiling. So, Mask was first shocked because he saw the heaven smiles coming at him, and then the second shock was because he sees the another smile. Ha ha ha, he says, as they do. Ha ha ha, he says. He falls down onto Mask but misses. Like, Mask doesn't actually shoot him, like, the Heaven Smile just misses. He falls down to the floor with a scrunch, which is what it sounds like when a, uh, a body smashes through wooden planks. It makes a scrunch sound. You can take it from me, and the comic. Mask then pooms him. Herc! And I'm not... I, oh, I th okay, yes. I wasn't really sure what was happening until now. He shot the grenade in the Heaven Smile's mouth. Okay. Actually, I couldn't really... I wasn't really comprehending what was happening there until right now. The S Heaven Smile's mouth was open. He shoots the grenade in the mouth. That's why the Heaven Smile is herking. Mask then kicks the Heaven Smile, whose head is in the middle of exploding, into the other Heaven Smiles, who I guess have been just waiting there for the past few seconds. They've been patient. I mean, I know it's the comic book time thing where you see a bunch of people and characters in the middle of an action, and they can just be in the middle of that action for way too long. But, I mean, yes, so they're still charging at Mask. Mask is now kicking the exploding Heaven, heaven Smile, the another smile, into these Heaven Smiles, and Krakoom! Krakoom is... They all go! And Mask walks out of the fire looking all badass with his cape fluttering and his eyes glowing red. I mean, his eyes never glow red, but it looks cool. It looks cool. Another close-up of Mask's eyes. He's intense. He's serious. He's keeping an eye out. What is going to happen next? Mask 
creeps around the corner. Oh no! Well, we know who this is. John DePaul working in the kitchen. The kitchen is a lot messier than I remember this in the game. I, I seem to remember uh, Jean DePaul saying that the head chef says that a, a good kitchen is one that you can eat off the floor. Uh, this does not seem like that kind of kitchen. I'm just going to say. Mask threatens him straight away. Again, just pretty different from the game. He says, you so much as giggle and I'll set you on fire. Uh, Jean de Paul is only a junior chef. Mask is skeptical, as well he should be, since we know he is not simply a junior chef. I'm not, not sure what's with all the flies buzzing around Jean de Paul. You would hope that the kitchen would be kept in better shape than that, and the meat would be fresher than that. That you wouldn't have all these flies buzzing around. Anyway, he's cleaning up. Mask doesn't seem to believe him, and I can understand why. He's in the middle of chopping up a pig. It does not look like he is cleaning up in this kitchen. He asks about where the others are. DePaul says, you mean the guys with the smiling faces? And the dialogue is how it was in the game. Mask walks away and advises him to hang on to that cleaver until you reach the front gate. DePaul wants Mask to wait, because maybe he recognizes him. He asks him if he is THE Masked Smith. He says he thought he was dead. He was the greatest wrestler of all time. What happened? Mast says that he has changed careers. He cleans up messes now. We did read in the game that before Mask hit the big time, he suddenly vanished. We don't know how. I mean, all we know is that he's part of the Killer 7 now, but we don't actually know how and why that happened. Mask leaves the kitchen, and DePaul says, Awesome. With, that is a wonderful grin. It's a wonderful smile happening on his face right there. Oddly, the best part of this scene, the bullet headbutt, is not actually in the comic. And that's weird, isn't it? You'd think they'd put that in there. If they were if they were gonna keep anything from the game, you'd think they would have put the part where DePaul shoots a bullet at Mask and Mask headbutts it. It's not here. I I don't understand that. I cannot explain why it is not here. Well, it, what I would say though is that DePaul's smile looks a lot more sincere in the comic than it does in the game. In the game, he has a very crafty, sneaky. <laughs> He says, because of course we know he's a spy. Here, he seems very happy about meeting Mask. Mask continues walking through the restaurant, and he does make a, a valid comment that it is a very large restaurant. It is entirely too big and has many outdoor areas. Mask reaches a different part of the restaurant. He puts his head down and plow, plow, he goes as he bursts into blood. And I do like that the comic does actually render this, this seemingly nonsensical thing from the game, where when you change into a different persona, you explode into blood. No one in the game will ever actually see that. I, I, be, I would be kind of curious to know what someone else sees when you do that. Like, would they see you exploding into blood and changing into someone else? What is it that someone else sees in the game, in Killer7, when you do that? Unfortunately, we will never know, because it's never brought up. But here, Mask plows. And then sizzes. And more sss. He continues to sss. Until finally, sss. Garcian Smith. He changes back into Garcian. Garcian enters the door. He looks at something. It's Julia. Julia is standing there saying that Mr. Fukushima will see you now. As Garcian points a gun with just the thickest suppressor you've ever seen at Julia. It's just like a huge metal tube wrapped around the barrel of the gun. It's enormous. It's, and the game, it obviously does not look like that, but it looks like it here, at least on this page. Because perspective is hard, you know, especially when you've got deadlines. 
Garcian asks, does Julian know why he's here? Julia says, yeah, Fukushima-san is expecting you. But is he expecting to die? Because that's what we're here to do. And this is something that is not brought up in the game itself. That uh, Julia and Mr. Fukushima welcome the Killer7, or Harmon in particular. They welcome him. I mean, they know he's there to kill him. But he's very polite and invites him in for tea and refreshments. Garcian is a bit puzzled at this behavior and asks, Is he expecting to die? Julia insists that Mr. Fukushima will explain everything as Garcian points his gun with his entirely too short arms. Look at Garcian's adorable arms in that panel. Look how short his arms are. Like, if he were to put his arms down, they would, like, go down to, like, the bottom of his ribs, probably. His arms are way too short right there, and it's adorable. But enough about his arms. Julia has opened the door leading to Mr. Fukushima's room and smoke billows out. For some reason, I don't know why. Because there's no smoke here. It's a dark room as Fukushima resides within. A little bit of a difference here is that Garcin is the one to speak with Fukushima instead of Harmon. It makes sense that Harmon would have done it since Harmon is the leader of the group and Fukushima is a very powerful influential man, so it made sense, you know, for, for them to have a meeting together. Um, Harmon, however, is not here. Rather, Garcian is going to speak with Fukushima. Garcian wonders how he knows his name, but Fukushima knows a lot of things. Does he know that Garcian's here to kill him? You know, it doesn't matter anymore. Death is light as a feather. Duty is heavy as a mountain. Garcian's a bit puzzled as to this meaning, as Fukushima tells Julia that she should bring them some tea. Fukushima talks about his history, talking about how he wanted to be a tea master. Garcian brings up the Rising Wind Party. Fukushima starts talking about World War II, which wasn't really brought up in the game, but apparently in the comic, at least, this is Fukushima's origin. Oh, and yes, that's right. Garcian's surprised to hear World War II mentioned. At least I'm gonna assume he's surprised by hearing it. Because I'm looking at that face. I'm looking at this drawing of Garcian. And you tell me what sort of expression that is supposed to be. You tell me what the emotion is there. This panel of Garcian that is covered up by two other panels, partially. Garcian's skin and is just sort of coming off of his mouth, and the pr proportions of his head are just kind of sliding off of his body. I'm not sure what's exactly happening here with Garcian's head. I don't know what's happening. I mean, you can tell me if you want. I think he's surprised. I think that's what that's supposed to be, because he says, what? Also, Garcian has a blue eye here. Garcian does not have blue eyes. Uh, that's like the smallest error in this panel. That's like the, the, the lowest problem in this drawing of Garcian right here, because there's a lot of problems happening right here. Let's move on to the next page. Fukushima says that only seven Japanese soldiers survived. 100,000 died. They preferred death to surrender. Because death is light as a feather, as such it's easy to accept, but duty is heavy as a mountain. So Fukushima accepted duty instead, which has been difficult, I suppose. Fukushima says that he was one of the seven survivors. Garcian's not really interested. He just wants to know what this has to do with the rising wind. Fukushima insists on continuing to tell Garcian his backstory. He says that Okinawa, he was the only survivor of the platoon. And the, uh, the Americans used a flamethrower. The attempt apparently was to suck the oxygen out of the cave he was hiding in. But, I mean, he was burned horribly, as that will happen when you're shot by a flamethrower. He didn't die, though. He survived. He thinks that God spared him. 
Garcian is skeptical. He's like, I mean, I don't know if Garcian has much room to be skeptical because Garcian has seen and has been part of some apparently supernatural things, but he doesn't believe this. When Fukushima awoke, he was in an American hospital and he realized that Japan had lost World War II. He was destroyed. He had nothing left. What could he do at this point? But now we have these... <laughs> We have these not great drawings of Fukushima's face going through some emotions, a variety of emotions. And I'm just going to say that Fukushima in the game look a lot more dignified than this. The same way with the restaurant staff, like all of the Japanese people in this chapter looked a lot more dignified in the game than they do in this comic. Fukushima says that things have gone wrong because Japan must be great. God wants Japan to rule over the world. So how could Japan surrender if it's God's will that Japan must dominate? Well, God spoke to Fukushima. He said that he, Fukushima and six others were spared for a reason. God chose them. I mean, you might have some guesses as to who God is. You might, you might be able to figure it out who God is supposed to be. Garcian says, he finishes the sentence for him, that uh, Fukushima and the six others were chosen to found the Rising Wind Party. Fukushima says that as Japan embraced its no new role as slave of the United States, he was working. He knew that one day Japan would come back into dominance, because God came down and smoked to the seven survivors. He gave them the Yakumo, and the Yakumo will restore Japan back to its rightful place. So, sort of ties into the game, but a little bit different. As Fukushima explained it, he and six other young politicians formed a group known as the Union Seven, and they attempted to reform the Japanese government. And in the game, the Union Seven write up the Yakumo policy, uh, which is this, like, it's a piece of, it's like paper with some sort of policy on it on how basically to run a country basic i say basically because there's something transcendent about it something divine about it it gives you some sort of perfect knowledge allows you to do things that other people cannot do and in the game it sounded like the union 7 wrote it themselves however even though they had this amazing perfect document that would allow Japan to come back into power, the pettiness of Japanese politics broke up the Union 7, sabotaged them, and in a sense, Japan sabotaged their own revival, basically is the idea. In the comic, however, it's a bit different, in that the seven survivors were all survivors of Okinawa, and I don't, that wasn't mentioned in the game. I forget if that's mentioned in the timeline, but I'll have to check, take a look at that. And according to the comic, the Yakumo was given to the Union 7 by God. God being Kunlan, of course. You probably figured that out. Um, but in the game, I don't remember there being any mention of Kunlan writing the Yakumo. It sounded like it was the Union 7 that wrote it themselves. Now, Fukushima is saying that events have been set into motion... And nothing can stop them, not even Fukushima's death, which is why he does not fear death. His death will not change anything. And here comes the tea, and you know what happens now. Fukushima gets blamed. Garcian is shocked as Julia is standing there, gun in one hand standing over Fukushima's body as Garcian stares at Julia. And hold on, I'm just... I just wanna... Let's, I just wanna... I just wanna look at that. I just wanna look at Garcian's expression right here. It's pretty good. That expression is all right. I think Garcian has some kind of uh, skin irritation going on around his nose. It's like it's it's like he's getting a lot of warts there. He really should get that looked at. That is like he's getting some kind of 
bizarre outbreak, and I'm worried about Garcia, and he should get that looked at. But there's no time to get it looked at now, because we're confronting Julia. Garcia mentions, hey, that was his job. But then he realizes, oh, thanks, I guess you did it for me. Julia then points her gun at Garcian and is holding it in a way that is very unlikely for a professional assassin or anyone who's ever used a gun to actually hold a gun. I don't know what's going on there. There's a lot about this comic that I don't know what's going on. A lot about the way it's being drawn. And I don't... She's holding it like an eye line... It's like lined up with the top of her head. Is she actually... How is she aiming that? What is she doing with that? The more I look at it, the more... The more it doesn't make sense. And yet, that is how she... That is how this professional assassin is holding the gun. Julia demands that Garcian hand over the Yakimo. Much like in the game, Julia does not have the Yakimo. And for whatever reason, she seems to think that Garcian has it. Garcian expresses his, his confusion to Julia's legs, saying, what's the Yakimo? I mean, he just heard the name. Fukushima said it. It's just that Fukushima died before he could say what it is. And Julia has no patience for this, so she tr attempts to blame Garcian. Garcian, however, I guess dodges the bullet and then flips. He flips in response, and his suppressor is much smaller. It's much thinner now than it was before. And then, in response to the flip, Julia's gun spacks, and Gar Garcian lands with a thump, because I guess he jumped in the air. I guess is what that was. He was in the air. Julia's gun has been spacked. And now Julia, her, her hand, is wounded, and she dropped her gun. Garcian realizes that Julia is the other assassin sent to kill Fukushima, and then... Julia asks Garcian what the hell is the Yakimo, except I assume that Garcian is supposed to be asking that, because in the next panel, Julia says, you mean you really don't know? Even though that speech bubble that says, what the hell is the Yakimo, it's clearly pointing at Julia. She's clearly asking it. Let's move on. She starts laughing. The Yakima will destroy your country as she pearl pulls her pearl necklace off, bites into it. Garcian yells, no, as the pearl necklace eeps. And then Julia pows. And that's what happened in the game. It seems like she gives up really easily in this comic. Like, in the game, she was shot over 100 times by Khan. So then she blows herself up. Okay, sure, she's on the floor dying. In the comic, though, she only gets her hand... Uh, wounded. I'm not sure why she blows herself up so easily. Garcian pulls his hands up to protect himself from the blood. And he looks down on Julia's body, which is dead. It is very dead. Garcian walks out of the restaurant. The in th This background shot's pretty nice, at least. This environment... It's better drawn than many of the things in this comic. I, I, let's, let's just say that. Garcian calls up Christopher Mills. Mills has some intel on the assassins. One of them is Julia, as we know. He names her as Julia Kusagi, when it's actually Kisugi, I think it was. She, infilt she infiltrated Fukushima's network, act acting as his secretary. Garcia informs Christopher that he that she's dead. Mills says that it doesn't matter, and that the other assassin was the one that was posing the one that was sent to protect Fukushima was posing as an assistant cook. Garcia is shocked to realize that the cook is an assassin, and also shocked to realize that what a bad job DePaul did. If he was sent there to protect Fukushima, and like he didn't even try to go after Mask after Mask left, even though it was clear <laughs> Mask was clearly there to kill a whole bunch of people, um, DePaul does not actually try to do anything to stop him from reaching Fukushima, so he's not good at his job, I think. I mean, Travis basically says that DePaul is a subpar assassin in the game. Um, 
Mill says that DePaul is a rising wind mole. He's attempting to interfere with secret talks between the U.S. State Department and the Japanese Liberal Party. So again, in the game, uh, the U.N. Party is the majority party. The Liberal Party is the minority party. The Liberal Party were the ones who sent Julia to kill Fukushima because with the U.N. Party bigwig out of the way, the Liberal Party would try to gain power, if I'm remembering this correct. So things are kind of mixed around in the comic as to who's doing what to who. Uh, the Liberal Party in the comic seems to be the majority, and the Rising Wind is an extremist party. Garcian asks if the Yakimo means anything to Mills. Mills has never heard of it. Garcian says it has something to do with the attack on the IEC. Mills has the secret coordinates for the talks. It's going to happen in the Kaku building, as we know. And that is the end of issue number two. Next month, Torah, Torah, Torah. As Garcian snaps his cell phone shut. Here's some, uh, just some editorial stuff at the end. One thing that's kind of interesting, I think, that we could look at is... What, what was this this label publishing at the time? They were publishing like G.I. Joe, G.I. Joe Sigma-6, G.I. Joe vs. Transformers, Forgotten Realms, Dragonlance Chronicles, Black Harvest, Hack Slash, I guess you would really pronounce this Hack Slash Slash, Killer7, Purgatory, Lost Squad, How to Self-Publish Comics. Elsinore and Lo-Fi Magazine. So it looks like they had a bunch of licensed stuff hanging their hats heavily on G.I. Joe. Next month, coming in April, we have issue number three. However, I should mention that even though uh, Omeda is appearing on this cover right here, uh, Next, the next issue is not actually Cloud Man. The next issue uh, is what takes place in the Kaku building, um, the second part of Sunset. So I'm not entirely sure why Almeida is shown on the cover. He's, he's really not in that issue. So, I think that's it. Yeah, that is the last page of issue number two of Killer7 the comic. We have now completed mission number one, of Sunset, it basically went as it did in the game. We went through Restaurant Fukushima, blowing up a whole bunch of Heaven Smiles. We met Mr. Fukushima, spoke with him. He gets killed by Julia, who wants to know where the Yakimo is. And then we shoot Julia. Well, I mean, in this case, she was only shot once. She blows herself up, and that's kind of it. And now we're going to go to the Kaku building. So we're going to continue on. With this wonderful, wonderful, professionally made comic book uh, covering the events of the video game Killer7. I hope you're enjoying the comic as much as I am. Uh, oof, that's man. <laughs> it's amazing how this comic tells the same story but does so just completely robbing it of any charm or uniqueness that the game has. It's amazing how good of a job it's doing at doing that. Now, I know that wasn't the intention, but it's doing a bang-up job of that. That's it for issue number two of Killer7 the Comic. I'll be seeing you at another time for issue number three as we go to the Kaku building to stop Jean de Paul and see how those Mahjong negotiations are going. I'll see you at another time for that.